I wish more people had asked me what I want to do and challenged me to define the wants in, in more creative ways, and I encourage parents to do the same. Um, I like drawing. I've always wanted to do art, but I went to art class or had it at school, and the art teacher told me I didn't wasn't very good, so I should go and find something else to do. Um, pity, and the, you know, it's it's find things your children want to do and find a way help them to do it in a way that they can grow. You know, even if if they want to learn a musical instrument, help them learn a musical instrument. If they want to be creative, find a way that they can express that safely and encourage them. Um, because so much of our life we spend patching up the things we're not good at. And so little of our life we spend accelerating the areas we can excel at, that the sooner we find those, start those, and do that acceleration, the more fulfilling life we'll have. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Doing creative work can be kind of lonely, and that's why we built the Unmistakable Listener Tribe. The tribe is a community for professionals to connect and support each other. Everything is designed to help you grow your business and share what's working and what isn't. And that's true whether you're a business owner or an artist. You'll get access to feedback, live conversations with guests, and so much more. By joining the tribe, you become part of a community of creators who all support each other, and it's completely free. Hopefully, I'll see you there. Visit unmistakablecreative.com slash tribe to join. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash tribe. Michael, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Srini, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, likewise. So I came across your work because you actually wrote in to tell me a little bit about the work that you were doing around Zone of Genius, and you showed me some of the mental models and frameworks that you apply to this concept, all of which we will get into. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to start by asking you, what social group were you a part of uh, when you were in high school, and what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? I heard you were going to ask that question, um, but I didn't prepare an answer. So <laughs> the the social groups change at different ages. Um, I'll talk about my sort of high school world. I stood out because I came from a an established family. My father was a doctor. I was used to participating. My early education was in a, a public school system, which is the private system in, in the UK. Um, but some people respected the, me being different and some people didn't. They thought, you know, he's a snob, he doesn't fit in, we don't care. So I was happy to surround myself with people who like to study, who people like to work. And then we found we did barn dancing, you know, I did sports. So I was always happy to find a group of people who want to do something focused and I was very happy to join in. Mm -hmm coming from a family that uh, you had a reputation for prestige, was there any pressure from uh, family to pursue certain career paths or to focus on certain interests? Um, yes. <laughs> and um, so my, my father, the doctor, I'm one of three sons. Um, and interestingly, there was no pressure really to become a doctor, but there was structure around, you know, go to school, you're not allowed off school, do your homework. Um, and you know, the focus was on, that's the right thing to do. Um, you know, you read the book, you do what the teacher says, you fill in the tests and you get straight A's. Um, A's weren't easy for me, but I sort of worked at it and it was frustrating that I had to work. I felt twice as hard as some of my cohort to get straight A's and I didn't quite achieve it, but the expectation was you'd get a good education, you'd go to university, you'd focus on something proper. My proper skill was engineering, and and then you'd get a job and you'd be comfortable for the rest of your life doing what you should be doing. And mm -hmm. it didn't quite work out like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it rarely does for, for most people. Uh, I think that in my mind, that is a sort of cultural narrative that's a one-size-fits-all solution. 
as somebody whose work centers around this concept of zone of genius, why do you think we have this narrative uh, or this prescriptive life plan, particularly within the education system, that rarely leads to a person's zone of genius? Um, I think it comes from you know comfort. We all like to fit in, um, and the structure around us is about doing things the way they used to be done because that worked in the past and therefore it'll work in the future. You know, there are people breaking the model with sort of Montessori schools and different Rhinus, uh, Rudolf Steiner, higher education, trying to say, no, let's just some people be creative, grow, and then they'll become the right fit rather than force them through this series of textbooks, this series of learning structures that, that teach you really to think one way and it might not be the way you were designed to think. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a sort of, you know, my reflection is, I learned to use sort of, if you like, simplistic my left hand brain. I learned to do math and engineering, and I was competent at it. But it, it clearly wasn't my zone of genius, and I wish I'd twigged that thirty years ago rather than had to sort of wade later in my life to find things I really love doing that I'm easy, are easy to me, and I have fun at. Yeah. You mentioned that comfort uh, really is often what drives this. And I heard uh, Susan David once say in a TED talk that discomfort is the price of admission for a, a meaningful life. And that really struck me because I think about all the sort of things that I've changed of, uh, over the course of my life, and particularly in the last 10 years as I've worked on this project. And how, how I, I guess, do you uh, build that tolerance for discomfort that allows you to eventually find your zone of genius? Um, you know, I feel you have to be open to uh, receive messages, and if you're closed, you won't get them. The language I've tended to think about more is, is feedback fuels success. If you can't find a way of giving yourself or getting other people to give you feedback, you're going to stay doing what you're doing. You think you're right. You probably aren't. And and because it's comfortable, you'll just stay there. And and what a waste of potentially such, you know, bigger talents. So it's difficult to go and search discomfort. Um, and yet, you know, I like to push just a little bit so people fall down. Because once people fall down and realize they can pick themselves up again and brush themselves off and move forward again, it's always progress. You know, people who are trying to learn a new sport, skiing or something, and, oh, I mustn't fall down, I mustn't fall down don't make any progress. And, and I like in the zone of genius that we're not really pushing people. We're just asking them to answer some questions, but we're softly confronting them with an answer that may or may not be the one they expected. And then they have to internalize that because they were their answers to a standard set of questions. It's not whether I'm right or wrong, but I am getting them to think about now how they think. And that's probably the first time in their lives many people have done that. A different future starts with you. That's why GoDaddy does more to help you find a name. You can create, sell, and get found online so any small business can make a change. We need a new generation of thinking. Your way of thinking. Start different at GoDaddy.com. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. Uh, okay. Walk me through uh, leaving high school to the work that you're doing today. Um, how did you get there? What were the significant inflection points? What really planted the seed for this idea of exploring uh, this zone of genius concept and developing the frameworks that you've developed? Gosh, that could be a long story. Um, Which is totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I quickly mentioned that, you know, at school, I was good at science. I like practical things. Um, I lived a bit in the countryside, so transport was important to me. So I learned to fix bikes, then I learned to fix cars. So here I am, good at fixing stuff, good with physical things, and therefore, oh, you're an engineer. And I didn't have any reason to say I wasn't an engineer. Those were the things I liked. And that headed me towards university, studying mechanical engineering. And, that, you know, I was competent. Um, I liked the practical side of it. This was stuff I understood, I could explain, I felt I could fit in. But, uh, it, you know, there was a bit where of the, I don't know, six, seven hundred lectures over four or five years, one stood out and it was absolutely nothing to do with engineering. It was all to do with 
management and organizational development and Hertzberg and hygiene factors and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, you know, I remember it 35 years later as if it was yesterday, and it's the only lecture I can remember. Um, so that was obviously formative at some level. I uh, did some engineering work, but quickly got on to the sort of customer side of companies in a technical side, so doing service support. And that seemed to fit. I'm now dealing with people, dealing with technical stuff, and I'm earning money, so I'm sort of in the right place. Um, I was traveling a lot, and it got a bit – I need to make life choices. I was just starting a family, and I didn't want to be the dad that wasn't there when the kids were growing up. And so I, I did stop that job and look for something different. I tried to go self-employed because there's a, an entrepreneur in me that every five years throws in their job and tries to find something better to do. Um, it didn't quite work out, but I ended up joining a Swiss training company um, called Crowdhammer, and they were fundamental in helping me understand that the way we communicate and the way we think can have a huge influence, and that you know we focus most of our attention on our conscious mind, and yet it's our subconscious mind that does all the controlling. Um, and in that sort of subconscious space, I was then awaken to the fact that, you know, an open question has a huge more power than a closed question. Why? Because it actually invites people to inquire about themselves and other people rather than impose on them basically a pre-ordered decision. So here I am interested in people now doing some um, coaching, training sessions, loving it. And it's still, you know, it's almost too far the other way. My life's now structured around people, and I've lost a little bit of this sort of technical side that I've lived in for 20 years, and I, I needed a bit back. Um, so I ended up at Ford, um, and here I am now in a big company that somebody's actually heard of doing useful work. Um, I got onto a nice project in electric vehicle space, and this is 15 years ago. And here I am planning the future, using technology to help for a brighter future, um, and it, it, it's a good fit. I'm doing project management. It's a big team. So here's people, here's technology. And yet every single problem I have is usually a people problem, not a technological problem. And, you know, Ford was spending millions of dollars to launch electric cars 20 years ago. It wasn't technical problems. It was people problems. And it, this really fueled me into saying, well, I need to choose what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'd much rather stay now in the people problem space and fix that than in the technical problem space. So I'm moving around a bit. I'm looking for jobs in that space. I try a couple of companies on my own. I'm again in the startup space in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And I meet up with Brian Suchia, who's trying to do a small incubator and runs a big meetup for startups. And I, I reach out and say, look, I'm interested in entrepreneurship. I'm interested in people. Can we work on a collaboration whereby you know, you've got this practice of helping them as an individual. What if we get two voices in there? Then maybe they, they get more dimension. And he liked the idea, and we planned some training programs. Um, and that sort of was then the foundation of us collaborating to help solopreneurs and other entrepreneurs get going. Um, and, you know, one morning he was explaining to me, he'd had an interview with one of his uh, – clients and you know he, he'd gone through his standard four thinking model and you know there's these dreamers and these builders and these designers architects and these people pleasers um, and you know she's obviously one of these visionaries and, uh, and dreamers and I, I sort of put the phone down on him and I and politely um, but I went and googled this concept of people thinking differently and I called him back 20 minutes later saying Brian you know this thinking differently concept I, I love it but I've Googled it. I can't find it. And he said, well, I, it's obvious. And I thought, okay, well, it's obvious to you. It's not obvious to me. I said, where, where does it come from? Well, every time I meet somebody, it's easy for me. They're always one of these three or four dominant categories. Um, I, I said, okay, well, this is great stuff. For me and my technical structural background, I can't just rely on the Brian Suchia opinion on this. We need to do some research and we need to come up with a, a structured way so I can help these people as much as you can. And ideally, we'll try and help them help themselves because that's scalable. Um, and therein, the journey, if you like, started with 
me creating a set of questions that didn't work, um, but it inspired Brian to say, okay, well, that's because they're the wrong questions. Here, try these. Um, and we got those questions and we put them in front of a group of, it was one of his meetups, 100 people. We were using Excel spreadsheets and other things to sort of go through the test. But we got great feedback. People liked the idea of thinking how they think. They liked the idea of being assisted or to give themselves permission to spend more of their time doing what they're good at. Brian loved the idea of being classified as a dreamer visionary, and now he was could go and do more of this stuff and, and feel comfortable at it. And I was equally empowered to, you've always wanted to be a people person. You've always known this is what you do. Here you are in, in your language now, clearly identifying as a cultivator, go cultivate. And, and you're looking for something to do, do this. Um, and keep doing this and see if you can grow it. And here we are seven, eight years later. <laughs> I'm chipping away at it. It's grown very steadily. And, uh, you know, 10, 15,000 people are, are more enlightened about how they think. And that's, that's a great thing. And hopefully a few more after this podcast will uh, engage in the process and we can help even more people. Yeah. Great. All right, cool. Well, we'll come back to, to some of this. Uh, I want to start with the lecture that you sat in on and, and the one thing that you remember. Uh, why do you think that, that that's not more common? I, I wish I could tell you that there were certain college lectures where I had that experience and I can't think of one. Um, I, it, somehow it's it, it had to be on the edge. You know, it wasn't something I expected. It wasn't something I was looking for. It was actually a a professor that other people thought was a waste of time. And that sort of immediately got my attention because I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a supporter of the underdogs, but they have to be an underdog in my opinion, not in somebody else's opinion. Um, so I go into this place open-minded, looking for an opportunity. And, and it was just, this is obvious. This is fantastic. You know, I've always, I think these are important things and I don't have to read a textbook. I don't have to spend 10 hours studying them. I don't have to do this. I went to the lecture. I get it. It's easy to remember. I wonder if I'll remember it 20 years later. And I do. <laughs> so I don't know what it was about the setup, but it was aligned to me. And therefore, it was easy for me to. Choose NetJets, the worldwide leader in private aviation, to ensure safe, seamless business travel. Thoughtful in-cabin design and cutting-edge technology allow you to continue meeting even with those on the ground. Reliable travel with NetJets means in-person opportunities are never missed again. While we continue investing in our response to COVID-19, you can remain focused on doing what's best for your business. For help finding a solution that's right for you, speak with a private aviation specialist at NetJets.com. Remember. Mm. For parents who are listening to this, uh, how would you encourage them to look for moments like that or, or help their kids find moments like that in their lives? So I wish more people had asked me what I want to do and challenged me to define the wants in, in more creative ways, and I encourage parents to do the same. Um, I like drawing. I've always wanted to do art, but I went to art class or had it at school and the art teacher told me I didn't wasn't very good so I should go and find something else to do um pity and you know it's it's find things your children want to do and find a way help them to do it in a way that they can grow you know even if if they want to learn a musical instrument help them learn a new instrument if they want to be creative find a way that they can express that safely and encourage them um, because so much of our life we spend patching up the things we're not good at, and so little of our life we spend accelerating the areas we can excel at, that the sooner we find those, start those, and do that acceleration, the more fulfilling life we'll have. And, and that's, I'm a parent. I've worked hard with my children to do that. They're, they're relatively conventional um, in what they're doing, but if they come to me, they know they're going to get options and encouragement to be on the edge or think outside the box because staying in the box is their choice it isn't really what i should be stimulating them to mm. be stuck in so, 
we're talking about vocation and work. And uh, I shared this quote on Facebook yesterday. It was from a book that I read uh, called The Industrial the, the uh, Zero Marginal Cost. And it was by an economist named Jeremy Rifkin. And he said, a half a century from now, our grandchildren are likely to look back at the era of mass employment in the market with the same sense of utter disbelief as we look upon slavery and serfdom in former times. The very idea that a human being's worth was measured almost exclusively by his or her productive output of goods and services and material wealth will seem primitive, even barbaric, and be regarded as a terrible loss of human value to our progeny living in a highly automated world. As somebody who looks at zone of genius within people's lives, what do you, what do you think the meaning of, of what Jeremy Rifkin says is for what you teach and what you talk about? Um, wow. So I think we have a life purpose. I think we need to try and proactively choose and participate in that unique life purpose for us as individuals and engaging with others. And I don't think society is set up to help us do that. So don't let society drive the conversation. Um, money to me is, is a double-edged sword. If you earn more, you spend more. And yet we strive to earn more and then find ourselves spending more. So the quality of our life very often doesn't improve at all with an increase in material things. You just have more stuff. And then that becomes more baggage and you need a bigger house. And so I'm a, a great believer in, in find some balance, balance in life, balance in how you think. Um, in some people's eyes, there was balance way back when with slavery. It was just imbalanced on one society um, and it was wrong. I think in today's, we're not in quite the same imbalance as wrong um, but, you know, we've got China and India striving to become middle class and live like Americans. Um, America, if everybody on the planet lived like America, we need, what, four, four and a half planets worth of resources now. So it's not the right aspirational goal for the planet. Um, and I'm, I won't be there to see it. I'd like to think his projections a little pessimistic. Um, but I... I'm a great believer in I'd rather trade services and support. I do a lot of mentoring, a lot of coaching, never out of my mouth. First thing is, well, this is how much it's going to cost. Out of my mouth is always, well, let's see if I can help you. And if I can help you, then we can discuss mm -hmm. where we go from there. Um, and, you know, and I said to you, with your model of uh, podcast, and everybody else have some of that sense. I meet lots of people like that. I'm optimistic. There are millions out there. And I'd like to hope that prevails in terms of a, a society we're less constrained by geography now with the internet and everything. We live on a common planet. We only have one planet. And the more of us that help towards life, harmony, balance on that planet, the better off we're all going to be. Wow. Well, let's do this. Um, let's shift gears and let's get into the four types of people that you were talking about. Can you define them for us um, and talk about the various characteristics of the four types? Um, happy to do so. Um, there are lots of four type models. Um, we chose to call ours um, a visionary, a builder, architect, and a, a cultivator. Um, I'm mentally programmed to talk about them in that order because it's the way <laughs> they've always come out. Um, and somehow, you know, you have a poster child, clearly the visionary is the poster child for our quiz and what most people, most people who take the test actually come out in that space, 40%. Um, and for sure, most people who take the quiz want to come out in that space. Um, they don't all get there. We originally called the space dreamer. Um, because we wanted to confront people with this, some sense of non-reality in that. But uh, Brian did a presentation early on to an MBA class and Dreamer de died. So Visionary became much more stimulating, and we, we then were happy to use the label Visionary. Um, visionary people, I'm sure, a big community um, in your world, are creative. They're creative in a way that they have ideas. 
perpetual ideas. Um, every day they wake up with a certainty that they've got a good idea and it's probably better than the idea they had yesterday. Um, they are very independently minded. Um, they're very capable of dealing in chaos because to them, it's just an opportunity to have a new idea and, and move forward. You know, why should they be constrained by what other people structures are? Um, they're entitled and empowered to create their own. The, these people find themselves, um, busy because they have this unlimited fuel of ideas and and the challenge they find is often that they're insecure about themselves and their ideas. Um, they're worried people are going to steal their ideas without any insight that they're actually going to have another one that might be better tomorrow anyway. Um, they're worried that, you know, they can't do everything. They try and do everything and can't. And uh, this sort of thinking style basically is very useful in a solo space um, visionaries tend to attract other visionaries. They have great conversations and they're having the same conversations years later because nothing's actually got um, brought together and fulfilled. So visionaries need to work with other people. Um, in life, we, we often have couples who take the careers. Very, very rarely is a visionary married to a visionary. Um, it's very, very common that they're married to someone who thinks completely differently because in a life space, you need to find balance and harmony, and a visionary needs balance and harmony with people who think quite radically differently um, in order to stabilize the situation. So this is the creative visionary thinking one way. Their opposite thought style is really the builder. So unlike a visionary that would think meditating is a huge benefit to life and well worth an investment of whatever time it takes and should be entered into every day, a builder would say, what a waste of time. I didn't get anything done. Um, you know, it wasn't useful. It, it was just purposeless. Um, and that this builder really has a thinking style about continuous improvement. They see things in the world, they see themselves, and they measure themselves in movement. Um, movement of time, how efficiently can we do something? How can things get done better? How can things get faster? This is a person that's often in a project management role or something that they're driven by organized structure. Um, and it's a typical product, if you like, of our education, because as you go through the education system, you're typically told there's a right answer. And um, if you follow the rules, there's a right and wrong thing to do. Um, so again, you know, where the builders find themselves in structures and organizations where following orders is the right thing to do, where they need this structure and law around them. Um, so that's a whole genre of uh, jobs and positions as well. Um, so we have the, the dreamer creator as a visionary, and we have the builder as the doer, continuous improvement. Um, so now we're into an architect. So an architect is a systems thinking. These are smart people. They're not dreamers and they're not doers, but they're very intellectually driven around finding a way to do the complicated things once or twice. Give them a problem, get out the way, let them go and think about it, and they're going to come back with a solution, typically an elegant solution, typically something that other people might not have ever thought about, but it's based on information that comes from laws, from regulations. It's usually not a creative leap of faith, but it is a structured, intelligent development of whatever the problem was. So they're problem solvers. They like to work on their own, um, and they find themselves in important jobs solving complex problems without too many people involved. Um, and then we roll into the cultivators, and the cultivators is really the uh, the people space. Um, people pleasers is one way of looking at it. Um, I see them as sort of the conductor of the orchestra. They're not necessarily excellent musicians, but they know how music is structured and played. But by collecting people together and listening to them and ensuring proper communication goes on, um, they are able to 
live their lives in their zone of genius because it involves other people and helping other people and working with other people. Um, and at the same time, they're able to express their own selves through love or harmony or balance because they, they exist to, to live in a world with lots of other people, helping other people with harmony and balance um, around them. So that, that's the sort of wow. four simple structures, um, and it, it splits different ways depending on how you break it in. Um, visionaries and cultivators are sort of the big picture people. Architects and builders are sort of more the structured, organized people. Um, architects and visionaries are creative more than cultivators and builders who are more involved with the environment around them. Um, but hopefully that gives you a quick flavor of, of what these people are and, and what the thinking styles are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is it possible or is it likely that each one has tendencies of the other? Uh, I wonder that because I know that, you know, as you described that, I thought to myself, okay, yeah, in a lot of ways, I probably have certain characteristics of the sort of, you know, visionary thinking that you mentioned. But I also know that one of my sort of, uh, gifts or one of my abilities is to look at things through a systems lens, primarily because if I didn't, I wouldn't get a damn thing done. Hence the reason I have numerous systems to get writing done, to produce the podcast, to do everything. There's always a system. And if it, if it wasn't for systems, I would feel just this utter sense of chaos. Um, yes, everybody has all of these. Um, uh, my view on this basically is if there is a natural area that you're most aligned to. You know, yes, you could be ambidextrous, but typically most of us are right-handed and some of us are left-handed. Um, the same with the brain structure and the, the mind thinking. Most of us, well, in our analysis, of 70% of them have a single style, but there's a secondary style. You know, some of them are very close together. And, you know, from what you explained, we could easily find that, you know, Yes, you score high in visionary, and yes, you score high in, in architect style. But one of those is likely to be a more natural alignment to where your passions are, and the other is more an operational ability that allows you to fuel your passion. So, uh, so we should get your results and find out. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess the question that rises from that then is based on where or, or which of these four categories somebody falls into. How do then do they then take that and align it to a, a career choice that allows them to thrive? And um, great question. I, I'm always I'm asked this a lot, and I'm really continually trying to help people understand we're not trying to define what you do and don't do. We're trying to help you do it in a way that you're likely to be faster, better, and quicker. So in every job, in every activity, you know each of the mindsets can thrive. Um, obviously, the more space there is around the job for that particular opportunity, the more opportunity there is to, to spend more of your time in your, your zone of genius thinking style. Um, it, it's much more the way you do it than what you do. Um, and yet it's this, we did a small company um, analysis. There were 14 people in the company. They were doing technology stuff. And and go figure, they hired people like them, 14 or 12 of the people I think were architects. And and what were they bad at? Sales and social media. Why? Because <laughs> they they had to do it and they did it in a way where they got the systems. Well, I've I've posted six things today. I'm told to post six things tomorrow. So I'm posting. And there wasn't any concept of well, actually one that was relevant, that was human, that had this you know, that had the tagline right to reflect the image, you know, would be so much more successful than six done things. And th this is where, you know, having the cultivator do the social media is likely to have a better result. But the builder or architect or visionary can do the social media as well. You know, they can do it. It's just unlikely to be fun for them and they're not likely to do it as well. Mm -hmm. uh I'm guessing one, how do people figure out which of the four categories they fall into? I know that you said you guys have a, a quiz, which I am planning on taking. So uh, let's tell people about that. Uh, 
the, the, I guess the other question then is, is, you know, what do they do with that information once they have it? So the, the hope is that they think about how they think. And irrespective of the result of the quiz, the fact that they've invested 10, 15 minutes of their time beginning to think about how they think and, and leaning into that space should always be helpful. Um, the result shouldn't be confrontative because it's simply adding up your preferred answers to the questions we asked um, and hopefully is empowering. I, I have had the opportunity to speak to hundreds of people who've taken the quiz. I didn't know them, but I see their four numbers and I'm able to articulate in a, a five minute sort of expression the kind of expectations I would have of somebody who thinks like this. And nine times out of 10, they go, wow, and you've never seen me. And, uh, you know, you understand how I think. You understand what the challenges are. You understand what I'm doing. And I only know that answering these questions this way reflects that kind of thinking. Um, so my hope is that people will learn to understand they do have a unique, and it's a talent to think in a certain way, and they will be more smart about finding opportunities to put their hand up or give that to me or let me do that in the, in the work they're doing because they're likely to do it faster, quicker, and have more fun doing it. You know, give a builder a project, go and come up with a list of 100 new ways of doing this business, oh, it'll be work. Give a visionary, then a cup of coffee, I'll be back in 10 minutes. And the, the quality of this is going to be better. So this is where we're coming from. I guess, and, and this might be a weird question, and considering I haven't been inside a, a typical corporate organization for, for quite some time, but I wonder, why is this not the standard way in which organizational development is done, considering it seems like it has the potential to lead not only to uh, people being happier with their jobs, but people actually being better at their jobs? Um, great question. So there are personality tests in corporations. Myers-Briggs was an early one. It's migrated to DISC and there's Energenetics. There's what color are you? Organizations are keen to help individuals understand that they're individuals and that not every individual is the same. Um, where we differ is we're trying to say is don't spend any of your time doing what you're bad at. Try and find more and more time to spend what you're really good at. And yet organizations are more around, well, everybody needs to get on. We all need to be good at this. Most of us need to be do what we're told to do because that's the way hierarchies work. And, you know, there's work that needs to be done, so go and do the work. Um, the better organizations do not put constraints on how the work should be done, um, which helps people grow. But sadly, there are still lots of organizations that not only define the work, but actually define how you need to do it as well which keeps us in this structural life that we weren't born to lead, but we just, well, I'm, I work to get the money. I don't take my body to work. I don't take my, I take my body, but not my brain to work. I do my hours. I'm paid for the work I do. Um, and, and what a waste of, of a life that might be. So we're, we're keen to try and change that. Large organizations are difficult to penetrate. Um, they have to be shown why it works, they have to be shown how it works, it has to come in with credibility and references. And what's been exciting for us is instead of banging our heads against corporate walls, we said, well, let's go after startups, let's go after entrepreneurs, because these are people who need all the help they can get. They don't put up barriers, they hold their hands out and say, please help me as long as it doesn't cost me any money. And, and it's been a great community to help us get this project off and running, because it's, it's the right place for us to show we can really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me think back to uh, job experiences I had where I was performing poorly and I got put on a performance improvement plan. And, and what, what always struck me about those performance improvement plans was you suck at this thing. We're going to make you average at it instead of, hey, you're amazing at this one thing. Let's figure out how to make you world class at it. Uh, and it, it seems that rather than optimizing for peak performance, what we do uh, or what organizations do is is basically try to uh, mitigate deficiency. 
I, I agree. I hate pips. Um, and, you know, talent management has, has come in. It used to be human resources and now it's sort of talent management. And people are they're sensitive that EQ now has a weighting where it was just IQ. They're sensitive that just because you can do it doesn't make you a good manager. Um, although typically it's still the right route to promotion is do a great job at what you can do and then we'll put you in a job that you weren't good at, you don't know how to do, but it's more important. <laughs> um, and, you know, is that changing? Yes, I think it is. I mean, this economist's view of gloomy view of the world will be if corporations survive, that is what will happen. But if, as it's changing, certainly in America, you know, startups become more the the norm. People are entitled to get out there, build their own website, create their own communities, and and they could be just as smart, if not smarter, than the people who've been doing it differently for the last hundred years. Now, is money going to be the currency of the future? I have my doubts. We see all this um, Bitcoin and other currencies coming in. Like I said, I, I personally would like to see a barter system come in because if we can change the currency, then we can really start beginning to change the way people value what people are contributing and, and hopefully um, change the way organizations define work and people don't have to work. They just live their lives and, and make a useful contribution doing so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I think I'm, I'm having a lot of questions lately in my mind about what is the way in which we're going to organize society. Uh, because if you look at uh, various economic and social, uh, economic and political systems throughout history, almost every one of them have failed in some form or another. Uh, you know, capitalism, socialism, fascism, like all of them have, have had fatal flaws to them that haven't led to <clears throat> ideal outcomes for humanity. Uh, and I've never thought about it this way, but uh, but I wonder, in your mind, what do you think that the future of work will look like based on your own research and your own knowledge? Um, what do you hope it looks like? Yeah, not, not work. Um, <laughs> I, I hope it looks like balance. I hope it, you know, some countries really value family. They really value time off for lunch. They really value vacation, holiday time. Um, and this is where, you know, Scandinavia is a good example, perhaps where, you know, there's a lot of people and a lot of an environment where there is balance. There's balance in what they do, how they live, who they are. They're soft on the planet. They're comfortable in each other's company. They often, you know, their after work drink is to go to a sauna. So they're naked in front of each other. I mean, you know, imagine that sitting down with your colleagues all naked. That would change the way we look at work. Um, so I, I just hope it becomes life, not work, I think. Well, I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Um, being different. You know, it's this stickiness. I I do talk to lots of startups. I hear lots of pitching ideas. I'm really curious as to whether the name they use is something I can remember. And the next day I remember the idea. And, you know, the more you can go through life, hopefully with something that's sticky, um, that's to me how you become unmistakable because unfortunately most things aren't that sticky. And uh, I don't really want to get my hands all sticky. And I hope that Zona Genius has some stickiness to it. But... <laughs> It, it's it's tough, you know. I wish I was doing this when I was twenty, not when I'm fifty. Um, mm. We can only get up every morning and try, and uh, hopefully find the thing that works in our zone of genius, and that trying is is valued by others in a useful way. Well, I think that makes a really fitting end to our conversation. Where can people find out more about you, your work, and everything that you're up to? Um, so the the website we're currently working under is is my zone of genius. I'm very active on Twitter at my zone of genius. Um, just type in Google Zone of Genius and I'm not all over the place, but I'm a good chunk of it. And uh, even if you're not reading my Zone of Genius stuff and you are reading Zone of Genius stuff, it's a community that's really trying to help you focus on being the best you can be. And, and that's a community that I want to see grow. 
Awesome. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. As the worldwide leader in private aviation, NetJets has said for more than 55 years that our top priority is the safety of our owners and employees, but our actions, especially in the past year, demonstrate our priorities louder than any words. Because of our extensive COVID-19 precautions and exceptional service, our flight demand is now higher than ever. Ready to rediscover your favorite places? Connect with a private aviation expert today at netjets.com.